All right. Well, hopefully you were able to watch that and you were able to see how, you know, hopefully you picked up on what they talked about, about how um, they had Stanford undergraduates volunteer to participate in the study. And then they randomly assigned them to either be guards or prisoners. So any sort of helpless behavior or freak out behavior that you might have seen in the prisoners um, or any sort of sadistic behaviors that you might have seen in the guard. These were people who were randomly assigned. So why did the situation bring out, you know, um, sort of submissive behaviors or freak out behaviors if you were assigned to be a prisoner, but they brought out sort of sadistic behaviors if you were, if you were assigned to be a guard? It kind of implies the situation is pulling out of people um, behaviors that they probably wouldn't have expected to have been pulled out of them. Um, my son-in-law pointed me to a discussion that it comes up honestly about every 20 years on the Stanford prison experiment that really it was all faked that the, um, the participants were just pretending to have freak outs or whatever. But uh, hopefully having seen this video and thinking about the, this, the way it was set up, you would realize that yes, Zimbardo did tell the guards to do whatever was necessary to maintain a control of the of the prisoners. And he provided to them those mirrored sunglasses to give them anonymity. And he's the one who gave the prisoners um, a cuff around their ankles to remind them that they were, you know, shackled. Um, like he, he tried to put them in the mindset of the situation and it happened. He was really surprised how quickly he didn't think it would take 24 hours and they would be trying to rebel. He thought, you know, this is going to take a week to emerge. And he was really surprised that it happened as quickly as it did. So some, some of the criticisms that it was either faked or that Zimbardo coached everybody how to act, that's still an argument in favor of the situation being influential, isn't it? Because even if he, co he had to coach those, um, let's assume that he had to coach the guards to act in these sadistic ways. If they, if their personality was a non-sadistic personality, they would have refused to behave in that way. But what the argument is, is that the situation can be so powerful that it will pull out of you things that you wouldn't have expected out of yourself. And that is, and it seems to me like even the argument, it's all fake, is an argument that it's all fake because look how powerful the situation is, which is the whole point of the, the whole exercise. All right. Well, hopefully you enjoyed watching that video or at least got to watch it because YouTube didn't know you were under 18. <sighs> anyway. Now, something that we've already kind of touched on a little bit is the personal versus social situations. And I wanted to revisit the issue of like field independence and field dependence. I kind of gave you a gloss earlier and told you we'd talk about it more. Well, here it is time to talk about it some more. So people who are field independent have a tendency to judge an entity in isolation, regardless of the background influences. So I've got a picture here where we are studying the tree. Um, People who are highly field independent, who notice the elements more than they see the whole scene, are much more independent in a social situation. Um, they tend to be more consistent in their behavior, regardless of what the situation is trying to demand of them. Now, even the most field independent person will cave in the context of certain um, kinds of powerful situations. But if we stick with the Stanford prison experiment, for example, there were guards who wouldn't push the line. They didn't go along with the rest of the guards who were trying to like quell a rebellion and other things that happened. There were uh, prisoners who just went along with the program and didn't try and rebel and didn't have a freak out and didn't have any of those things happen. They were just basically um, going along with their own you know, tendencies to behave in certain ways. And they didn't let the they didn't let the situation overwhelm them. Some people who can do that are probably more in field independent, where they see the elements, they don't see themselves as being part of the situation, but an actor within the situation. People who are field dependent tend to judge an entity in its context. So here we have the forest, right? So we're not studying any of the trees independently, we're looking at the forest, right? So people who have this tendency to judge an entity within context tend to notice the background influences. They tend to um, notice what other factors are causing the situation to be the way the situation is. 
people who are feel dependent are more likely to conform in social situations and go along with the group. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that they're agreeing with the group, but their behavior conforms so that they, they seem to be going along with the group. Uh, in studies of conformity, we have found that there are two different explanations that people tend to give when they conform with the group's behavior. One explanation is that they really think that maybe the group is seeing the information correctly. Like maybe the group is right and I should be acting this way, right? Like I didn't notice this about the environment, but the, everybody else did. And so how can I be right and all of them are wrong? So I'm going to go along with them because they're probably seeing it correctly. So in that case, they're using the, um, the rest of the group, the other people around them as information. They're like, they must be right. There's, you know, five of them and one of me. So I'm, I must be the one outlier. I'm wrong. Um, the other reason why people will report conforming in a, in a situation is that they know full well that everybody else is wrong, but they don't want to experience the social isolation or the, um, everybody looking at them for non-conformity. And so they'll, they'll go along while mentally knowing full well that the group is wrong. So now put this into the Stanford prison experiment and say, okay, so why was this person acting like this? Why was the, this guard being abusive to that prisoner? Well, it could be that the guard is conforming because, um, they think that there's information that, that they don't really fully understand, but everybody else is, is conforming. And so that everybody else must be right. It must be the right thing to do. Like maybe I didn't see this prisoner misbehaving, but all the other guards are reacting as if the prisoner did. So I'm going to react that way too. They probably have information I don't have. Um, and there are probably some guards who went along with it because they knew full well that it was wrong, but they didn't want to suffer the sort of social punishment that goes along when you don't conform. And so they went along with everybody else for that reason. Both of those fall under field dependent tendencies to, to conform in those situations to either one of those explanations would, would be more common among a, a field dependent person than with a field independent person. Um, so that's kind of an important thing to keep in mind when you think about, you know, well, like, would I, would I conform to what the rest of the group is doing? It really, there's um, partly, you know, your innate tendencies, you know, whether you're the sort of person who will um, take the context into consideration, including, you know, what everybody else is doing. I think there's also, just to reassure ourselves about, about that kind of situation, it, um, you know, our confidence about our perspective ha plays a big role in whether we will conform or obey. Um, if we're really sure that what's going on is wrong, we're we are a lot less likely to conform. It's in those ambiguous situations where we're like, I don't really know what happened. I don't really know what I'm supposed to do. I know you like that makes it much more likely that any person would be more likely to conform. So um, a lot of us like to think we wouldn't conform if somebody asked us to, you know, we wouldn't obey if somebody asked us to do something harmful or something. But the truth is we really don't know until we're in the circumstance, whether we would be um, field independent about it or field dependent about it. We really don't, a lot of times we don't know. And so you get put in the situation then you find out. Um, so a little bit of an abrupt shift from situational factors to something maybe more internal that might make us more or less empathetic with somebody else would be uh, a fairly recent discovery called mirror neurons. Uh, mirror neurons are specialized neurons in our brains that fire in the same way for our own actions as they do for observed actions of others. So whether you're the one who's reaching for the peanut or someone else is reaching for the peanut, the same exact neurons in, a, in particular little areas of your brain will fire exactly the same way. Um, so we think that this is one of the things that allows us to have an empathy. You know, we literally can put ourselves in someone else's perspective. We, we, can, we can imagine so well because our mirror neurons are firing that we can say, I, I do know how that person would feel. You know, I know what mindset they're in right now. Um, once mirror neurons were um, discovered, and actually they were discovered by accident, there was a study being conducted of um, 
rhesus monkeys and they had certain motor neurons wired up to um, EEGs to detect the activity of their um, motor neurons are the neurons that direct physical activity. And so they were just collecting information from the, the right arm of the monkey as it was supposed to reach for a peanut. And um, the monkey was on a break, but he still hooked up to his um, EEG collecting information. And then um, the peanut was just sitting on the counter and a human came by and picked up the peanut and it caused those neurons in that monkey to fire the same way they had been firing whenever the monkey reached for the peanut. And the researchers at first thought some mistake had happened. Like, why did that monkey's motor neurons just fire when his, his arm didn't move? Um, so they did it a few more times and they started to realize, and at first they were going to call these monkey see, monkey do neurons, but they decided it's more efficient to imagine these are, you know, like if you were looking in a mirror, it would be like you're watching yourself move. Well, so shortly after discovering it, they started figuring out how it works. It came up with the conclusion that it was probably the basis for empathy. And then they started to think, I wonder if these are, play a role in autism, where people have a, a really hard time putting themselves in somebody else's position. Um, it's the, the biggest thing that is impacted by autism is the theory of mind. The theory of mind is our ability to develop a theory about what's in the mind of the other person that we are dealing with. Um, and so this is something that they're looking at right now, the role of mirror neurons for autism. But I wanted you to see this guy describing mirror neurons and exactly how they work. And um, we'll come back after this video and talk about, talk about this a little bit more.